the concept was building assets. Say assets. Say it like it's sexy. Assets. Say it louder. Assets. Yes. That's the definition of wealth, ladies and gentlemen. Assets. Sexiest word alive. So anyway, I volunteered my time because of what I'd learned in the talking book and talking game. And I said, I'm going to help you commercialize this game. So I started working with them, and that's what it started to look like. And all of a sudden, he said, well, he wanted to charge $200 for it. And I'm going, well, having been in retail, I said, well, that's a little pricey for a board game. Maybe we should write a brochure that kind of shares our philosophy that would be getting people to want to invest more with us. So we wrote a brochure for the board game. It was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now, it's still not a word has been changed. We thought our brand was cash flow. We wrote Rich Dad. It was the first of 15 books we wrote together. It took the world by storm, not because of us, but because all of those who raised your hand, if I ask each and one of you, say somebody told you about it, it was a true viral marketing success before the internet. This was when we still had to sell them through stores. I would still get orders by fax machines. Remember those? Yeah. I sold the first million books out of my dining room table in Phoenix, Arizona. So it took the world by storm. We went all over the world. Now, this time we were a little smarter, though. We said, rather than writing big checks to companies like Disney, we want to be the company that people write checks to. And so we established the brand. At that time, financial books were red, green, black. And we said, no, we want it to be purple. He said, no, you, that, nobody has purple books. And we said, that's why we want to be purple. The, why not? Why not? Let's have them purple. And so now you go into business stores, and what do you see a lot of? Purple, yes. And so we created this, and we had an incredible ride, 10 years as partners. And at the end of that time, of course, somebody earlier today talked about, do you love the people you work with? Well, at that time, I'd kind of lost a little love because we weren't really on the same page. He wanted to go into franchising, and I did. it was a great deal for us. It wasn't a great deal for the franchisees. And so I made the decision to leave at the height of our success and start my own company called Pay Your Family First because I wanted to get back to truly creating affordable product, products that will help people take control of their financial lives. But about six months later, I was having a good old-fashioned pity party. Any of you ever have a pity party? Let me see. Yeah, all right. I, I, lots of honest people in the room. Yeah, that's a good thing. It's like, what have I done? I never regretted leaving, but, you know, that was a lot of money to walk away from. So one Friday night, the phone rings. Phone. Okay, just reminding you. Phone rings, and the caller ID says, White House. Well, there's a florist in Phoenix called the White House. So I thought, wasn't that nice? Somebody sending me flowers. It really was the other White House. Unbelievable. In 2007, the caller ID actually said White House. Unbelievable. I doubt it does today. But it was a huge honor to be asked by President Bush to be on the first President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. I served both President Bush and President Obama. But the point I want to make is I would not have gotten that call had I still been at Rich Dad. Sometimes you have to close one door for other doors of opportunity to open for you. And that's what happened for me. A few months later, I got another call from Don Green, the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. How many of you have read Think and Grow Rich? May I see by a show of hands? How many have not? Wonderful. I highly recommend you put it on your reading list. Napoleon Hill wrote Think and Grow Rich back in 1937. It is as relevant today as when he released it in 1937. I read it when I was 19. 
didn't realize the impact it had on me until I was in my 30s. But it's so powerful because it's not one man's philosophy. He spent 25 years researching success. Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in the world, introduced him to the 500 richest men in the world. I underline the word men. There weren't any women in business back then. But he came up with this synthesis, like the term paper of success, and is as relevant today as when it was released in 1937. So Don Green called me. I still remember it, March 20th, 2008. Another phone call asking me, we all know what happened to the economy in 2007 and 8. Remember that? Well, at that time, most people, and now I say young people under the age of 50, I'm getting up there, didn't even know who Napoleon Hill was. And so he said, we needed to reinvigorate those teachings. And what an honor I had to be asked to step in and write, write the first renewal book talking to today's great leaders about how they got through adversity. Napoleon Hill is the one that came up with whatever your mind can conceive and believe your mind can achieve. Now, Napoleon, how many of you read or saw the movie The Secret? I see. Okay, that law of attraction. Napoleon Hill wrote about it in 1919, long before Rhonda Byrne was even born. Nothing to fear but fear itself, Napoleon Hill. So you may not know him, but you know his work. The term pay yourself first, Napoleon Hill. He also said, the, he's the one that said, out of every adversity, every failure, comes a seed of an equal or greater benefit. And so in Three Feet from Gold, we had the opportunity to talk to many of today's great leaders, not the egos, but the leaders of great brands. And if I'd known Brenda, then you would have been in the book. So we wanted to find out how you got through the tough times. And from it, we synthesized a personal success equation. And so I ask you, as we walk through this, to think about how this applies in your personal life. Because in school, we're taught to do everything by ourselves. And I often say business is a team sport, so it's appropriate that this event is a team summit. Business is a team sport, but that's not what we're taught in school. When we collaborate in school, it's called cheating and we get in trouble. In the real world, collaboration is great. So this success is their passion and your talent. Now, again, passion, do what you love, love what you do, right? Well, in my case, my passion came out of anger. Anger that we weren't teaching our kids about money in school. I said, we've got to do something about it. And ladies and gentlemen, that anger is as fierce today as it was in December of 1992. So what is your passion? What drives you? What do you care about so deeply, either through love or anger? And then your talent. Now, of course, I'm a CPA. I learned all kinds of things about publishing, so I was able to combine those things. But I couldn't build a company on my own. The success of every company I've built has been because of the team and the power of association. And that's what's so wonderful about these types of events, where you can come together and share experiences, share best practices, and support each other. Associations are not just your team members, your mentors, your vendors, your customers. It's making sure you have people on your team who are strong where you are weak. Because if you just have a team of yes people, you're not going to get very far. You want a team of people that come together and support you in every aspect. And then... That second A was action. God gave us two legs, two hands, a mind. We're supposed to take action. And Napoleon Hill, who came up with the law of attraction, also said, be enthusiastic. Go the extra mile. Take action. So the concept of just sit here and think good things and good things are going to happen to you, good luck with that. 
We're supposed to work at it. We've been given talent. We've been given the opportunity. We've been given the roadmap. But we need to take action to create success in our lives. And we almost went to press before the last element. And I said, there's something about these people that are different. And it was the faith that they had. Faith not only in themselves, but faith in what they were doing. Faith that it was needed and necessary. The most successful businesses do one of two things. Solve a problem or serve a need. You guys absolutely solve problems and serve needs. But faith in what you're doing, faith that it's needed and necessary. Now, what keeps us from applying that? Think about in your life. What might be missing in your life? Your passion, your talent, your associations, your action, your faith. Many times, I can point to it immediately when I meet a, a, a business person or an individual who's a very successful employee, but they're still feeling adrift. And it's that power of association. Again, reaching out and building yourself with your network and supporting others within your network. But what gets in our way? Lack of motivation, couch potato, inertia. And that means we're not passionate enough. Lack of passion. You know, we just aren't in that interested. I think you used the word drain earlier today, a drainer, right? Well, when I talk about the outwitting, the double book, Napoleon Hill called it drifter. So we're going to talk about that. Wrong associations. Certainly, we all know people. How many of you know someone who has wrong associations? Yeah, yeah. And it's hard because you get swayed by having people around you who want to hold you back. And you know, sometimes it's your own family. You start doing something fun and you're, you're making progress and you're successful and your family isn't. They're not taking action and so they kind of pull you back. Of course, they become your biggest fans when you're successful because they want a loan, right? Yeah, so but again, you want to figure out who you're spending your time with. But the biggest one is fear. Just fear of changing. That fear of being uncomfortable. We were talking about earlier today. And again, Napoleon Hill, most of the difficulties in which people find themselves are of their own making because we're fearful. Fear does one of two things. It paralyzes us, and that's what it does to most of us. We cave in, we get smaller, we stay in the dark, and that doesn't help. It just makes it worse. Or you can have fear as a motivator to motivate you to take action, to do something about it. And when we released Three Feet from Gold, I got another phone call from the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And he said, we found a manuscript. Napoleon Hill wrote it in 1938, the year after releasing Think and Grow Rich. The title scared his wife to death called Outwitting the Devil, and she forbid it to be published. So it was locked away for 73 years. This is what it looks like today. And they sent me the manuscript, and I went over to San Diego, a little odd about it, thinking, you know, I don't really want negativity in my life. My daughter is a minister, and she says, Mom, let me pray over you. <laughs> yep, she really did. So I go to San Diego, and it's literally a manuscript, typed on a manual typewriter with his handwritten notes. Whew. Awesome experience. In two hours, I read the manuscript, and I knew it had to get out because it talks about that fear. When, As I said, Napoleon Hill spent 25 years writing Think and Grow Rich, his life's work. And when he released it, he was frustrated because he says, even though people know what they're supposed to do to become successful... They don't do it. Does that um, apply to anybody in the room? I know there are times when it applies to me. And so he sat down and he just kind of downloaded this Outwitting the Devil book in a few short months. And in it he talks about, he has a conversation with the devil. And 
he says to the reader, you can imagine that I'm talking to the real devil or the man-made devil. It's up to you, the reader, if you derive any benefit from what I say. But he talks about different kinds of fear, fear of poverty, criticism, ill health, loss of love, old age, fear of failure, and yes, fear of success. We're going to talk about that more. But this fear binds us, keeps us from achieving what we deserve. Now, we all have that little angel on our right shoulder and that little not-so-nice person on the left shoulder. This is not a political comment unless it's appropriate for you. So, But the, that little devil on the shoulder says things to you like, you're not worthy, you're not an expert, you're not good enough. Easy for her to say, she's on the stage. So I want everybody to work with me here. Everybody raise your right hand. Hi, hi, the other right. Yeah, right hand. Good, good, good. And like you're getting dandruff off that left shoulder, just let's get rid of the negativity. Okay? So next time, Tony Robbins has something where he calls trigger. You want to get in the right mental state? And so next time somebody's standing in front of you, might be your husband, your wife, your kids, neighbor, customer, and they're like going at you and you feel the negativity. You just want to smile and kind of just do this. Get rid of the negativity. It works. It works. <clears throat> I do have people during my talk, I'm halfway through and I see them going like this. So that's your trigger. Get me off the stage. Let's talk about where the negativity around money comes from. What was your parents' money about philosophy about money? Since we're not learning about it at school, where do we learn about it? Home. So what did your parents say about money? Shout it out. Doesn't grow on trees. Penny pinching. We can't afford it. And for those older, who do you think we are? The Rockefellers? Right? And what do all those comments have in common? Negative. Negative. And are you telling your own children? How many of you are parents? Let me see. Raise high. Okay, how many of you had parents? You like 100% participation. Okay, good, good. When we say we can't afford it to our children, we're doing the same thing. When you say something negative like that, we can't afford it, it's a closed-end statement, negative. So instead of saying we can't afford it, just by changing your languaging, you go, how can we afford it? The power of the question, you're opening your mind, you're plugging in those creative juices. When we're little kids, we're so creative, crayons, Play-Doh, and then we go to school, and all of a sudden, we're taught to conform. So creativity becomes conformity. And we need to keep that creativity alive. How can we afford it? That gets them excited to think about ways, become entrepreneurial, ways to help around the house. So our languaging is so, so very important. But as your parents, you know, they, they didn't know any better. But what happens is as adults, we've had these triggers all our lives. Money negative, money negative, money negative, money negative. So subconsciously, we're fearful when it comes to money. We're afraid we're never going to have enough. And then when we become successful, all of a sudden we're afraid we're not going to be able to keep it. And it came, it's underneath. We're hardwired. It's in our subconscious. So we have to learn how to let it go. So what happens? Our day, you know, let's talk a little history about money. For those of you who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I like to teach accounting with no numbers, okay? Real quick. Income statement, balance sheet. We, you know, we go get our first job and we have money coming in and it goes out. And hopefully we have enough coming in and out that we can pay our bills. And all of a sudden, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, falls in love, gets married, hopefully, um, moves in together, and they have two incomes. We've got two cars. We've got a house. We've got a mortgage. 
all of a sudden we have all this extra income, but we also have liabilities. Those liabilities are spent. So what's empty? Did somebody say something? What's empty? Assets. Oh, so much better. Thank you, because you know, assets are? Sexy. Sexy, yes. Assets are sexy. Assets. So you get your paid, you get your paycheck, and you're working for your boss, which is appropriate. We're gonna talk about that. It's not what you do for your paycheck that's important. It's what you do with your paycheck that determines your financial future. And you need to make sure that you know that you're the one in the driver's seat. You're making the choices with every dollar you receive. You're making the choice. Am I buying, building, or creating assets for my personal family? Or am I spending it never to be seen again? Choices we make each and every day.